this that time. The MC would invite it, could not make it. He had to, even though he came for something else, he had to do MC and do it together. Wow. I, I, I didn't mention it to you because I didn't even know. I mean, he's been very, very supportive, and I think he, I will. To me, this is a singular honor to be able to appreciate him for how he has helped us, support us as a company, and uh, to say we are very, very, we are very, very grateful. Thank you very much. So, thank you. I'm sure you enjoy the speech. It's a great speech, and he's it, so passionate about trade and economics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm more than honored to be here, and I'm so passionate about trade because. I, I, I was trying to get here today and I spent two hours in traffic from Victoria Island to Surulere in trade and dynamics. But I'm going to start with a quote by Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon said, the biggest mistake people make is that they trade what they need the most and what they need at the moment. That's the biggest mistake people make. They trade what they need the most in their lives for what they need at the moment. And that's what we have done since the beginning of trade. Trade has been as long as mankind. I say trade has even been as longer than the existence of mankind. Because the very first thing we did on that when we got on that was a trade. And we had various forms of trade. But I'll just narrow it down. Trade has been on since like the 300 BC, before Christ. But I'll narrow it down to key footnotes in trade history that really propelled in all of this. It really started when the Chinese started the Ming Dynasty. I'm talking about the 1500s. The first time China wanted to go to the world with their dynasties and they say they wanted to have a trade route. So they brought about what we call the Silk Road today that they're finally revisiting. And when they started this, they wanted to upset the Apoca. They wanted to create a change. They wanted to become the trade leaders and they became the trade leaders. Because they put infrastructure in place. And tell you what, you cannot have trade without infrastructure. Mm. What is infrastructure? Infra means up below. Structure. So infrastructure are the things that are beneath the structure of every nation that are carrying the nation. So take for instance, the infrastructure of this building is this pillar. It is carrying the pillar. So for trade to happen, there are things that should carry trade. Example, Third Mainland Bridge. <laughs> Example, Good Road in Tinka. Example, Seaport. Access Road, Railway to carry products out of Tinka in Apapa. That's what infrastructure is. It's like, so the Chinese started building a lot of infrastructure. They had continued since the 12-1500s. Recently, China completed one of the longest rail tracks in the world from China to Germany. So now it takes you less than 35 days on rail to carry a lot of freight from China to Germany. They call the thing Silk Belt and Road Initiative. They spend over 5 trillion US dollars every year to build infrastructure. They are ready for business because if you want to take the world, you need to show the world you mean business. And trade continued after that. You had the Trans-Sahara trade. You had slave trade. We forget that slave trade was a trade. Some people became so wealthy from slave trade. And slave trade was so important that because of the viability, the market viability of slave trade, it led to the American Civil War. What caused the American Civil War? The slave owners in the South didn't want to give up their slaves. And a certain man called Abraham Lincoln talked about liberation and liberty. And the people in the South said no. And they said, rather than us giving up our slaves, we will give up our existence as a nation. So they left America, the Southern Confederate Army. And they fought the North. So it's so powerful. Trade is everything. And as this narrowed down, countries started evolving. Nigeria became a trading entity. In case you do not know, Nigeria was bought with a price, 1900. Go check this out. A certain man had been trading in this region because he saw the proliferation of oil palm and some other cash crops. His name is Goldie Tubman. He started a company called the Royal Niger Company. A Royal Niger Company was, you know, in charge of this area when it comes to trade. But while together in Berlin, the Chancellor of Germany, they called them together in Berlin in 1885. 
and they have what we call the Berlin Conference. So they told each other that, see, we are going to share Africa so that trading will be easier for one another. So that we will not have need to fight over trade. And that's why they had the Berlin Conference and they shared the continent. To ease off the burden of trade. And it continued. Because they had come in here, they had seen a lot, so they started trading. The Germans were one of the biggest trading partners in Nigeria, even bigger than Britain. In the 1850s, 1870s, 1880s, they were bringing a lot of alcohol into the system. And they were trading in exchange for a lot of things. The German steamrollers were constantly here. And trade was the order of the day. King Leopold traded so big in Congo because of the mineral resource. And you see this continued. Because anywhere trade goes, life goes. That's why you see that a businessman can kill. Georges Clemenceau, the Prime Minister of France in 1925 says, in a war front, oil is more important than blood. In a war front, oil is more important than blood. And that's why you see that people keep killing for oil. And that's the power of trade. Trade led to the First World War. And some people wanted to get dominance. And once they killed the man in Jack Ashton, Ferdinand, and everything changed. This continued into the Second World War. The stock market crash had fallen in America. It led to what we call populism, just like what is happening with Donald Trump. A man that was preaching populist ideology came into power. They called Adolf Hitler. And Adolf Hitler started the war. After the Second World War finished, the first thing people talked about was trade. Bretton Wood Conference. John Maynard Keynes came and he sat down, Dylan White, and he started talking about trade. Because of this, they started the first trade movement called the GATS, General Agreement on Trade and Tariff in 1948. This was what was overseeing trade all around the world, and the existence and the foreground of trade was under this GATS consistently. That was how the world power started. Because trade means more than anything to them. And they want to constantly keep the capacity for trade. They don't want to lose it. Distance. And while they were doing all of this, they were trading with Africa, looking for means to still get into the continent. That's why we were selling what we wanted the most for what we wanted at the moment. I'll give you a case in point. There's a man called Lord Sugar. Lord Sugar is a very prominent man. Lord Sugar owned Tottenham Football Club. By television. That was produced by a 25-year-old man. On the Udoji deal alone, the Udoji money they paid to a lot of people, Lord Sugar made not less than 100,000 US dollars in profit. A small businessman in the UK. Why? He understood the dynamics of trade. This continued into the 80s. Japan started falling apart. As Japan was falling apart, China started. And China's story is very peculiar. Why? It was in 79, after the Cultural Revolution. Deng Xiaoping came out to say, I don't care. If the cat is white or is black, as long as it kills mice. So he started trading with the world. He forgot the socialist mentality and said, let's trade with America. And he started. As of 1979, China only produced 40 units of air conditioners. They had nothing. As of 1979, if you are taking a picture of Lagos, the economic viability of Lagos was 10 times bigger than China. But as of today, they produce 40 million units of air conditioners every year. And they started trading. The shocking thing in 1995, trade equalized in the world. So all world bodies came together in a place called Marrakesh in Morocco. And they said, let us consolidate trade. And they started the World Trade Organization. 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization. <clears throat> From 2001 till now, China has almost usurped America. 7% of the American technology in the hands of Chinese. There's something called Thucydides trap. If I take it back history line, and I tell you the story of the Peloponnesian War, you will see that when a nation is about to change, leadership of nations is about to change, that something called the Thucydides trap happened. China usurped America in purchasing power parity. Trade is the order of the day. Trade made America go into what we call NAFTA, not Atlantic Free Trade Agreements. But they saw that it didn't favor them. That's why they're trying to end it now. Because it favored Mexico, it favored Canada. 
The world has become a dipolar place because of trade. Almost somebody cannot produce everything he needs. Despite how big America is, America still gets steel from Canada. America gets steel from Mexico and some other parts of India. But China has become the biggest winner, and that's why they're everywhere today. Out of producing nothing, they started producing something. In the space of over th less than 30 years, that they joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, everything changed for China. Number one in export of meats. Number one in export of this and that. What is it that China doesn't make? China has become the factory of the world. And it's not only China. The same with Vietnam. And I'll tell you about a little country called Laos. You can go check it out. Laos has said, as far as they're concerned, they want to be the battery of Asia. So what are they doing? They're producing electricity and selling it. Laos, a country less than 10 million, provides electricity for most parts of Asia. There is nothing you cannot sell. But like I said, everything stands on the structure of infrastructure. And what is infrastructure? Infrastructure is money. Infrastructure is a financial backing. Infrastructure is understanding how finance can change the dynamics of trade. Infrastructure is understanding scalability. Infrastructure is understanding that you have farms in the north, in Joss, that can produce strawberry. Now why would Nigeria supply the whole of strawberry to West Africa? Infrastructure makes you understand that it's not about oil, that crude oil will fail. And it has failed. Because the time we said Nigeria had strong viability economically in the 60s, Nigeria was doing one third of the tomato in West Africa. 65% of tomato eaten in West Africa in 1960 to 70 was produced in Nigeria. But today we can't even feed ourselves in tomato, importing tomato from Italy. We just had the tomato Ebola and it's all over. Infrastructure is thinking. Infrastructure is giving tax holidays and tax breaks to manufacturing companies, giving them the power to be able to scale. Infrastructure is signing trade deals all over Africa. Morocco understands this more than us. We are members of ECOWAS. What have we done with ECOWAS? That's why Morocco is begging to join ECOWAS. Because if Morocco joins ECOWAS, they know what they're doing. Do you know today, Morocco has been able to scale up trade and industry that most of the cars you drive, the steering wheels are being made in Morocco. The seats are being made in Morocco. No factories here to turn out cars. The Volkswagen factory is a relic of itself. Nobody's buying the pan in Kaduna. We forget that the German government makes well over 400 billion US dollars from the sales of Mercedes and cars alone. More products. What do you have to sell? Infrastructure is understanding that families propound the theory of trade. In Korea, most of the companies are family-owned companies. They are called Shabos. Samsung is a family-owned company. But what are families doing in Nigeria, fighting over property? In Germany, they are called Mittelstaats. Over 60 to over 40 to 60 percent of the German economy is run by family owned business. They're called Michel Start. So, when your brother says he's working in Germany, he's not working in a German multinational. He's working in a German family owned company. We forget that infrastructure is understanding taxation. Currently, you're telling businesses to pay 30 percent taxes in this country with no infrastructure. How are you going to pay? with no infrastructure. And the tax to GDP ratio is 6%. I'm even shocked at 6%. The target is about 11 or 20%. You want to be like Mexico, you put infrastructure in place. Infrastructure is understanding that in this current reality, trade has no borders any longer. And how have you been able to sell the things you have? Infrastructure is understanding the power of scale in business. I'll tell you a quick story. The Nigerian music industry, what has it done to rub off on science and technology? 
Do you know that it is possible to use money made from music to stabilize the economy of every country? As said, in 1960, Britain had a currency crisis. It was a record label that signed over four boys from Liverpool. They were called the Beatles. Do you know the money earned from the Beatles was what stabilized the British economy currency in the 1960s? This money was used by EMI to start research into something called computerized tomography machine to help people see patients properly and see the workings of the internal organs of each patient. The same money made from the Beatles was what was used to fund the research for CT scan. Today, CT scans are everywhere in the world. Nobody will ever believe that a musical company, a music record label, were the first people to form the CT scan. What are we doing with our music? That's easier to sell. It's time we stop exporting our crude oil. It is a curse on every nation that exports their crude oil. You think America doesn't have crude oil? Crude oil was first discovered in America in the 1800s by Henry Drake. But America will never sell its crude to the world. Why? Because it understands the power of value added. But America sells its crude to the world every day. Because you forget that, do you know that from crude oil, you can get this camera. Do you know this from crude oil? The plastic in this camera is petrochemical. Do you know that from crude oil, you can get this clothes, synthetic clothes? Do you know that from crude oil, you can get this chair? You know it's from crude oil? Do you know it's from crude oil, you can get the casing for that AC? Do you know it's from crude oil, you can make the, the metal straps on the shoe? Do you know the TV you watch is a byproduct of crude oil? Because we've lacked the infrastructure, we've lacked the developing industries. Petrochemical industries are one of the biggest industries in America. In fact, they have an index on the stock market. It's called the Dow Jones Index. Petrochemical industry, the Dow Jones Index. That's why America will constantly buy. And when they bought to a certain extent, what did they say? They said they were buying no more. And that's why the American started to feed them. What did I say when I started my speech? I said, Napoleon Bonaparte said, any man that sells what he needs the most for what he needs now. If you sell your crude now, it will give you quick forex. But do you know that some crude oil can give you trillions of US dollars? We're eating our dinner for lunch. Now we are left hungry in the middle of the night. That's what we've done with trade in this country. We've failed to develop infrastructure. Even when the forex from crude was coming in, we had the plan, the first industrial plan, plan from 1965, 1965, to develop heavy industries. What did we do? Did we develop them? From 1970 to 75, we said we're consolidating indigenization. Did we develop the heavy industries? How many industries do we have working? What do we produce? If you don't add value to it, you cannot get anywhere. Except we change from the mindset and the mentality of taking the raw materials we have and shipping it abroad, and we start to add value to it. We cannot change anything. The whole of the cocoa industry in Africa will never be as valuable as one of the biggest chocolate making companies, Kraft, in the world. Why? Kraft will make 10 billion US dollars. All your cocoa powder will not be bought with any money. What are you doing? It's a shame on Africa to start making chocolate and be excited about it in 2015 when you have cocoa in your backyard. It's a shame on us. So the challenge you have in your hands is that trade has changed. Trade now is intellectual property. How many apps are we selling to the world? All of us buy software. So these days, products and international trade are no longer tangible products. They're intangible products. You buy your Microsoft software. You buy a key to open up the app. It's an intellectual property. That's going to be the new trade. Because everything under the ground will be finished very soon.
People are starting to talk about the end of all. It's only the intellect of man that will remain. But are we ready for the challenges of the future? Are we ready for the zero-sum economy and the zero marginal costs that will be happening? Because everything will come useless very soon. It's not becoming useless with the proliferation of 3D printers. It's no longer mass produce. It's not power of production by the masses. So are you ready for that? Are you ready to innovate? Are you ready to recreate? Are you ready to enhance the future? Are you ready to look for how to add value? Is our government ready to invest in research and development? Are you even ready to steal the existing technology over? There are many technologies out there, open source. NASA has done all the work for you. They've given you all the capacity. What are you doing with the ones you have? You can't even do it. You, we can't still make a mobile phone in this country. But it's open source technology. When Techno started making their mobile phones, Techno didn't need to do research for the touch screen. The touch screen on your phone is a NASA invention. It's there in open source. You buy the patent and you put it. So the ones we have in open source, have we copied and pasted? It's out there. Everything from China. We still want to do hand shirts from China. We can't still do proper printing of books properly in this country. Ordinary books. You give a printer the job to do in this country, you're shocked what comes out. The things in open source have been perfected. These are the realities of the new generation. These are the things we'll face. And you see, it's a time for politics. So when politicians are telling you they'll build bridges where there are no rivers, like Charles de Gaulle said, <coughs> ask them, what are the structures, what are the infrastructures the economy will stand on? But if they can't give you ideas, I can give you ideas. I'll give you five ideas. Number one, this country should constantly invest in research and technology. Ensure that a sizable portion of our budget is invested in research and technology. Open new research halls all over the country. <coughs> a sizable portion of your budget. The United Nations says 26% of budget is spent in education. If you can take 40% of your budget year on year on research and technology, and this is done effectively, this country will move forward. Number two, Encourage businesses, manufacturing industry. Encourage them even more. Give them tax breaks. Give them quotas for production. Let them scale the productions they have. Number three, creating an enabling environment. Bring about viable social infrastructure. A man that is hungry cannot innovate. Bring about social infrastructure and interaction. The reason why people are fighting everywhere and killing people is because they are not busy. There are a lot of idle hands in this country. Get people to build bridges. Get people to build roads. You think that young boy in Ajegule, if he's in the construction site, all money all night, and he knows he will get good pay for what he has done, do you think he'll think of how to kill or rob somebody? Get them jobs. Put infrastructure in place. It's a shame that we're still talking about railway in this day and age. Make distance cheaper. Imagine the trade that will happen if you had a high-speed rail from Lagos to Kano that'll take you from Lagos to Kano in two hours. You know how many goods you can push to Kano? You know how it will stop prices of things. Number four, make credit available. All the money stolen can be made available. Put in a subvention fund and credit facilities. Let people go to banks and see interest loans at single-digit interest rates. Make credit available for people. Let them be able to tap into a rich credit base. Number five, the leadership should be the biggest salesperson for Nigeria. Do not vote a person that's not a salesman in. He needs to sell the product. What does Trump go to do everywhere? Sell products. We need to trade more. Because the reason why Africa has been aided all this while it's because we're not treated. Thank you.